Good afternoon or good evening, everybody. It's time to begin the second day of the workshop. And it's my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Michael Hartz from Saarland University, who will continue his mini course on Drury Arvidsson space. Please. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for, uh, for coming back. Uh, so the, uh, uh, the first slide of today is the, is the last slide of yesterday, uh, just to remind you, uh, of the uh, different descriptions of uh, the Dreyavison space uh, that we worked out. Uh, so we can think of it uh, as a space of power series uh, where the uh, power series coefficients are supposed to belong to some uh, weighted L2 space with these weights. You can think of it as a reproducing kernel Hilbert space with a very natural reproducing kernel. Uh, we can think of it as a, what's called a base of Sobolev space. Uh, so you demand that uh, a certain number of radial derivatives is in L2 with respect to an appropriate weight and we also have this NC point of view, uh, which was you take uh, functions in this uh, NC Hardy space and you restrict them to level one. Okay, so uh, what I want to talk about today uh, are, are multipliers and uh, how they relate to operator theory. So we've seen uh, multipliers in, in other mini courses and in other talks. And uh, so here's the definition. Uh, so the multiplier algebra of the, of the Dreyarison space uh, just consists of all functions uh, on the unit ball that leave the space, uh, the Dreyavison space invariant under multiplication. So the Dreyavison space itself is not an algebra, just like H2 is not an algebra, uh, but this thing is an algebra. And uh, it's an easy exercise using the ghost graph theorem to show that every multiplier gives you a bounded multiplication operator. And this defines the multiplier norm. So you just take the, uh, the operator norm of the, uh, of the multiplication operator. So with this norm, it's a unital commutative Banach algebra. In fact, it's a double a weak operator topology closed uh, non-self-adjoint operator algebra if you identify a multiplier with its multiplication operator. So I, th I think a good case can be made that uh, these multipliers are actually what's sort of really important about this space. And, and maybe they're actually the reason why, uh, why people care, care so much. And uh, I'm going to try to make this precise uh, today. So the most important example of, of a multiplier are the coordinate functions. Uh, so these functions z1 through zd, uh, they, they turn out to be multipliers and uh, they have multiplier norm one. Um, there are multiple ways to see it. Um, you can see it, for instance, in this power series description, uh, because if you multiply by zi, then you just shift the coefficients and the inequalities work out so that you have multiplier norm one. In fact, if you do this computation uh, a little more carefully, uh, then you can get something better. Namely, you can work out that uh, the sum of mzi mzi star is a, a recognizable operator, namely its identity minus uh, the orthogonal projection onto the constant functions. So this is supposed to remind you of the Hardy space, uh, because in the Hardy space, uh, multiplication by z is just the unilateral forward shift. So the adjoint is the backward shift, and then uh, forward shift times backward shift gives you uh, identity minus uh, projection onto the constant functions. So in particular, this operator here on the right is less than or equal to the identity. And this tells you that if you stick these operators into a row and, and you think of them as acting from D copies of the Dreyavis in space into one copy, just by you know, row vector, a row column multiplication, uh, then uh, this is a contraction. So we've seen this in, in, in Mike Drury's lectures. Uh, this is what's, uh, what's called a, a row contraction. So these are, uh, um, Multiplication operators by the coordinate functions form a commuting tuple of uh, row contractions. And uh, we're going to see today that it's not just an example, but it's, uh, it's in some sense a universal commuting row contraction. And, and this is why this space, or one of the reasons why this space turns out to be so important. Okay. Um, so, what are, so what is this multiplier algebra then? Can we, uh, can we describe this in, in somehow concretely? Well, the first thing you can observe is that if D is at least two, um, well, you have an inclusion into H infinity, uh, but the inclusion is strict. Um, and so, so let's have a quick look at, at, at why this is the case. Uh, so has, the inclusion is, is nothing special. It, uh, it works in great generality. And uh, the reason is quite simple. We've seen it before. Namely, if you have a multiplier, uh, then, well, the space contains the constant function one. So the multiplier has to be in the Hilbert space. And everything in the Dreyarison space is holomorphic. So you're certainly holomorphic. Um, and then there is the standard identity that the, the kernel functions here, they are eigenvectors for the adjoint of multiplication of the multiplication operator. 
and the eigenvalues are just the values of the uh, multiplier complex conjugate. So they're all in the spectrum of the adjoint and therefore the, the sup norm of the multiplier is at most the operator norm of the multiplication operator. So you have a contractive inclusion from the multiplier algebra into H infinity. And, and this has uh, not, doesn't really have anything to do with the Dreyerus in space. It works in great generality. Uh, but the interesting point here is that the inclusion is strict. Uh, so unlike in D equals one, in the case D equals one, when we have uh, equality, of course. And this is another instance where you know, different points of view suggest different results. Because if you think of the Dreyerus in space essentially as uh, you know, the, the Hardy space just in several variables, but then this is perhaps surprising. But if you have this definition with the radial derivative in mind, then um, this is maybe not such a big surprise because as soon as the derivative comes up, uh, you don't really expect the multipliers to be H infinity. I mean, this is just like we saw in Tom Ransford's uh, mini course on the Dirichlet space. And indeed, so, uh, Jingbo Sha and, and Shelly Fang point out in their survey that uh, if you look at this function theory description, then it's kind of clear that non-constant inner functions can never be in the Dreyerusian space because the derivative of those has bad integrability properties. Uh, so, so this sort of blows it out of the water, but uh, you can actually do it in elementary computation. So let me show you the elementary computation that, uh, that does it, that doesn't rely on, on inner functions on the ball. And so what you can do is you can look at uh, this uh, simple polynomial 2z1, z2 to the n, and by the inequality of arithmetic and geometric means, uh, this has soup norm equal to one, right? It's, uh, it's attained at one over root two, one over root two. But uh, you can estimate the multiplier norm in the Dreyerusian space uh, from below, uh, because the multiplier norm is always at least the, uh, the norm in the Hilbert space by applying to the constant function one. And uh, then you can work this out uh, using the explicit formula for the norm of a monomial. So that the two to the n gives you four to the n, and, and, and this thing is, uh, is this uh, alpha factorial divided by mod alpha factorial because alpha is the multi-index n comma n in this case. Right? And so then you, you use Sterling's formula, you get a whole bunch of, uh, of cancellation, but in the end, uh, essentially a root n factor survives, which tends to infinity. So this tells you that you don't have a bounded inclusion from H infinity into the multiplier algebra. And then there's various ways of finishing it up. You can just say, well, by the closed graph theorem, then you don't have any inclusion at all, because if, if you did, then it would have to be bounded. Or you can also do an explicit construction. Um, once you know this, uh, you can write down fairly explicitly a power series in Z1, Z2 to the N, which belongs to the Ball algebra, uh, but is not contained in the Dreyerus in space. So in particular, it's not a multiplier. So either way, you can, uh, 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 th this computation finishes it up. Okay, so then you can ask, um, well, so what is the description of this multiplier algebra? So it has to be a stronger condition than, than H infinity. And uh, the basic point is, well, if you take derivatives, then you need to use uh, the product rule, right? So uh, let's do a little uh, computation in, uh, in the case D equals two. So we know being an H infinity is, is a necessary condition. Uh, so suppose you have an H infinity function and you want to figure out if it's a multiplier or not. And we're going to use this function theory description, which says that a uh, function is in the Dreyerusian space if and only if its radial derivative belongs to the Bergman space. And uh, so when you realize, when, when you use this, then you want to check if uh, phi times f is again in the Bergman space. Uh, sorry, in the Dreyerusian space, you want to check if the radial derivative of, of phi times f uh, belongs to the Bergman space. And so you have to use the product rule, right? And if you use the product rule, then you see that this is r phi times f plus phi times uh, rf and and because phi was assumed to be an in h infinity uh, the second sum end is always fine right because uh, rf is in the bergman space you multiply with an h infinity function and you're still in the bergman space so, so this is uh, in l2a and so what you need to control is is you need to control the first sum end and so what you need uh, is that r phi times f is in the bergman space which is just the same as saying you need to know that R phi is a, a multiplier now from the Dreyerusian space into the Bergman space, right? So it should take the Dreyerusian space into L2A, right? Because for every function F in the Dreyerusian space, R phi times F should land in, in the Bergman space. And you can reformulate this in function theoretic terms. So what this means is that there exists a constant C such that, um, well, if you look at 
uh, phi times RF and you take the L2 norm. So mod F squared uh, R phi mod squared the volume should be less than or equal to the constant times uh, the norm of the function in the Drey Alveson space. And so uh, this is the condition you get in addition to being in H infinity. And, and this, is, uh, this is what's known as a Carlson measure condition. So you need to know that uh, this inequality holds, which means that R phi mod squared the volume needs to be a Carlson measure for the, uh, for the Drew Allison space. So this is similar to what we saw in the Dirichlet space in, uh, in Tom Rainsford's talks. So you, it turns out you can do this for, for high ID as well. Uh, the computations do become a bit more complicated because you, now you have to take higher order derivatives and then you get a, whole, a long sum. But uh, it turns out it's enough to control the, the top and, and the bottom uh, sum and in this long sum. And then uh, this leads to this theorem of uh, Ortega and Fabrega who, who characterized multipliers of the drey alveson space uh, in the following way. So uh, phi is a multiplier if and only if uh, phi is an H infinity, this we know, and you need a Carlson measure condition. And so the Carlson measure condition uh, should remind you of the function theory description of the drey alveson space. So uh, you have to pick some M so that two M minus D is bigger than minus one. Uh, and then you need to know that uh, this, uh, this quantity here, so the radial derivative times the weight the volume is a Carlson measure for the Drey Allison space, uh, which precisely so. So, by definition, this is this is what a Carlson measure for the Drey Allison space is. Um, so, there is an extra condition you need to check, and it's not automatic, uh, just from knowing that phi is an H infinity. Um, now, these Carlson measures for the Drey Allison space uh, were actually characterized in geometric terms by uh, Akotsi, Rockberg, and Sawyer, um, but the characterization is not particularly uh, simple, so, so I'm not going to, to write it down here. But in principle, it does give a, um, a function theoretic description of, of multipliers. Uh, let me also mention that even if you don't know what the Carlson measures look like precisely, uh, having something like this Ortega Fabrega theorem is actually very useful. And uh, so let's look at another uh, toy example. Namely, um, let's look again at d equals two. And suppose we have a multiplier which is bounded below. And uh, the question is, is one over the multiplier also a multiplier? Right. So that's that's a pretty reasonable question. And um, this uh, Ortega uh, Fabrega theorem says that what you need to check uh, are two things. You need to check that one over phi is an H infinity and you need to check the Carlos measure condition. Well, uh, one over phi being uh, in, in H infinity. Sorry, I'm struggling with my pen. All right. So one over phi in, in H infinity. This is of course clear because um, phi is bounded below. And then you need to check the Carlson measure condition. So you need to look at, uh, so, so D is, is, is two here, so you can take M equals one above. And, and then you look at the radio derivative uh, of one over phi. Um, and then you need to use the quotient rule. And so if you take absolute values, this is R phi divided by phi squared in absolute value. Uh, so, uh, you can bound this above because phi is bounded below by one over epsilon squared uh, mod r phi. Uh, so this tells you that if phi generates a Carlson measure, then so does one over phi, uh, because clearly if you're dominated by a Carlson measure, then you're Carlson measure as well. So if the Carlson measure condition is also fine, uh, it holds it. Oops. It, uh, it holds as well. Right? So this shows that at least in, in two variables, uh, if you have a multiplier that's bounded below, then the reciprocal is a multiplier again. And, and again, this can be generalized, although the computations do become significantly more complicated, um, but it, it can be done. And, and so, so then uh, what you get is that if you have in any uh, finite dimension D, if you have a multiplier that's found below, then the reciprocal is a multiplier as well. Uh, so you might recognize this as a, as a very special case of uh, the Corona theorem due to Costea, Sawyer, and Wick. Um, I'm going to say more about this tomorrow, at least that, that's my plan. But uh, just for this one function phi, um, there are easier arguments along the, uh, the lines of what I just did in dimension two due to Fang and Shah and due to uh, Richter and Sanders. So uh, one point I want to make is here, even if you're only interested really in, in an operator theory and you don't care at all about function theoretic descriptions, uh, this kind of result is something that you might care about uh, because it tells you, for instance, that the spectrum of a multiplication operator is exactly the closure of the image of the multiplier, right? And this is something that, uh, that operator theorists care about. All right, so 
so why are these multipliers uh, so important? Well, to explain this, uh, let's switch gears and uh, let's talk about operator theory. So the, the motivation for, for this comes from um, classical operator theory in, in, in one variable, namely von Neumann's inequality, which uh, says that if you have a contraction operator on a Hilbert space, so it has norm at most one, and if you plug it into a polynomial, then the norm of P of T is at most the soup norm of the polynomial on the unit disk. And as, as, uh, as many of you, of course, know, uh, this is a, a fundamental result in, in operator theory that really connects function theory on the disk to um, operator theory on Hilbert space. And so there are many uh, proofs of this uh, von Neumann inequality now, but um, the textbook proof usually uh, goes through uh, dilation theory. And let me explain this as well. So uh, the textbook proof uses this uh, dilation theorem due to Nag, uh, which goes like this. Uh, so again, we have the same setup. Uh, we assume that we have a contraction operator on Hilbert space. And then it says that you can find a larger Hilbert space K and the unitary operator on this larger Hilbert space so that you can recover your operator T from U in, in the following strong way. Whenever you plug it into a polynomial, you get P of T back by taking P of U, so this operator on the big space and compressing it down to the small space. So you restrict to H and then you put the orthogonal product projection in front. So you can think of this as T is in some way a, a, a piece of this unitary operator U. And uh, this of course, implies von Neumann's inequality because it reduces von Neumann's inequality to checking it for unitary operators u and uh, there it's easy it follows from spectral theory of continuous functional calculus for instance um, now it turns out there is a second version of uh, Nag's dilation theorem uh, which i want to mention because that's the one that actually generalizes nicely and uh, it looks slightly different um, and uh, so that it's so the the setup is the same but the difference is that now we get we only get an isometry V, so we don't get a unitary, but an isometry. But the advantage we have is we have a tighter relationship between the, the dilation and the original operator because we get an invariant statement. So we get that the original Hilbert space H is invariant under the adjoint of the isometry. And then you can recover T star as the restriction of V star to H. And once you have invariance, this also implies it for all polynomials. Um, so uh, you get a tighter relationship to the original operator, but the price you pay is you only get an isometry. Now in one variable, it's fairly easy to go back and forth between these two versions. Uh, so for instance, if you want to go from the second one to the first one, so if you want to go this way, then um, what you can do is you can take your isometry and you can apply the Wolf decomposition. So you write it as a direct sum of a bunch of unilateral shifts and a unitary and then you extend the unilateral shifts to bilateral shifts and then you get a unitary. Um, so this in this setting uh, of the second version we say that uh, t coextends to an isometry so a coextension is uh, an extension of the adjoint. Um, by the way there, there is a sort of a block matrix way of, of thinking of this which uh, I personally find very useful and uh, it looks like this so in um, in the setting of the first version of the theorem, you can write U as a block three by three operator, lower triangle, and you can recover T on the, on the diagonal here. And uh, in the second version, uh, you can write your isometry V as a, as a two by two matrix, and uh, you can recover T as the one one entry. Okay. So first version, you have it as a two two entry, and the second version is a one one entry. So. Uh, this, uh, in the second version, this says that H is co-invariant, and in the, in the first version, it's only what's known as semi-invariant. All right. So how about multivariable operator theory then? So how does this look in several variables? So suppose we have a tuple of commuting operators. So this means that uh, Ti, Tj is Tj, Ti for all i and j. So this is it's different now from uh, the situation that Mike Joy talked about last week. And uh, then the question is, can you do something like uh, Nog's dilation theorem and von Neumann's inequality? Now, you have to impose some kind of contractivity assumption. And in several variables, there's more than one reasonable contractivity assumption, just like there's more than one reasonable generalization of the unit disk. So one way to do it is to say, well, you think of the poly disk, and this corresponds to saying that your operators uh, should all have norm less than or equal to one. So this connects to function theory on the poly disk. And uh, the one sentence summary is that this works well for d equals two because there is a dilation theorem due to Ando. 
uh, which generalizes Nox relation theorem, but it's more difficult for D at least three. Now, this is not the, uh, the setting I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about uh, the ball. And uh, if, you talk, if you think about the ball, then a reasonable notion of contractivity is that of being a row contraction. So this is what we just saw. You, you, you take, take the operator, stick them into a row, and you want this to be a contraction. And the reason why it connects to the ball is, is, is very simple, right? If you take a tuple of scalars, and uh, then it's a row contraction if and only it belongs, it belongs to the closed unit ball. Um, you could also uh, talk about uh, column contractions if you like, uh, but then you have to take adjoints and all your statements. And uh, uh, just like in the non-commutative world, it, the row is, is, is perhaps slightly preferable because uh, these uh, multiplication operators by the ZIs on the Dwayne-Allison space are row contraction, not a column contraction. But you can translate things uh, by, uh, by taking adjoints. Okay, so there is a perfect generalization of the second version of, of Nag's dilation theorem, which involves uh, the Dwayne-Allison space, and it works like this. So we need one additional piece of, uh, of terminology, namely a spherical unitary is a tuple of commuting normal operators uh, so that the sum of ui ui star is equal to the identity. Uh, so well, you can write the star on the other side because they're normal, it doesn't matter. Um, and uh, so these are quite well understood because you have the spectral theorem. So at least in the separable case, um, they all essentially look like multiplication by the coordinate functions on some L2 space where the measure is uh, supported on the unit sphere. And then uh, this dilation theorem, which uh, so the first version was due to Drury, and then there was uh, and there's a version of, Drew, of Müller and Vasilescu, and sort of the ultimate version uh, is due to Arison, uh, says the following. Uh, so suppose you have a commuting row contraction on Hilbert space. Then T coextends to a very special operator tuple, namely to one of the form S direct sum U, where U is spherical unitary. So this is something we think we understand well. And S is a direct sum of copies of uh, multiplication by Z on this Drury Allison space. So you should think of this direct sum as, as being component wise, right? So it's uh, S1 direct sum U1 all the way up to SD direct sum UD. And so this says that up to this spherical unitary sum end, this multiplication operator by Z uh, governs the, the whole behavior of, uh, of these commuting row contractions. And it's in this sense that the multiplication by Z on this Dwayne-Allison space is, uh, is universal. Now, one thing you can do with this is you can prove a von Neumann type inequality, uh, which was done uh, first by, by Drury. And namely, if you have a commuting row contraction and you plug it into a polynomial, then the norm is at most the multiplier norm of the polynomial uh, on the Dwayne-Allison space. And so, so this is similar to the one variable von Neumann inequality uh, because uh, in the one variable von Neumann inequality, you had the soup norm on the right-hand side, which is the multiplier norm on, on the Hardy space. Uh, but now we get a bigger norm than the soup norm. Right? We just saw that the multiplier norm on the Drury Allison space is generally bigger than the soup norm. So I think when you see these, these two results, um, it's sort of, uh, it, well, at least to me, it's very convincing that this Drury Allison space is uh, an important space and that it's worth studying. And let me also point out, I mean, I uh, sort of hinted at it, but let me also mention again, this, uh, this dilation theorem, in, if, if D equals one, it really reduces to the, the classical uh, NAG, for, uh, or NAG dilation theorem, because uh, in this case, uh, the operators you get are a direct sum of, of unilateral shifts and unitary, which by the whole decomposition is, is just the general form of an isometry, right? So, so this is a perfect analog of the, of the one variable theorem. Okay. So let me say a bit more about this dilation theorem and, uh, and, and how the Dwayne-Allison space comes up. Uh, so there is a, a stronger statement in, uh, in what's known as the pure case. So let me explain this. Suppose again, we have a commuting row contraction T and then you can look at a, a certain map theta, uh, which uh, goes from B of H to B of H and it sends an operator A to some TI A TI star. Uh, so this is, this takes positive operators to positive operators, and uh, it's, an ex it's, it's actually a completely positive map. The fact that T is a commuting or is a row contraction uh, translates to saying that theta of I is less than or equal to I. So if you apply theta successively, then you get a decreasing sequence of positive operators in, on Hilbert space. So they converge in the strong operator topology. And we say that T is pure 
if this strong operator topology limit is equal to zero. So in just think of this in one variable, for instance, in one variable, this says that uh, T to the N, T star to the N converges to zero in strong operator topology, which is the same as saying that T star to the N converges to zero in strong operator topology. So this is what, what you know as a pure operator in, uh, in one variable. Now for, for pure, um, row contractions, the dilation theorem looks even nicer because then it says that every pure commuting row contraction coextends to a direct sum of copies of uh, this multiplication tuple MZ on the Drouet Alveson space, right? So the spherical unitary sum end is, is, is absent in this case because of purity. So in this sense, people also say that MZ is a universal uh, commuting pure row contraction. Uh, because every other commuting pure row contraction coextends to a direct sum of uh, of this one uh, particular operator, and this is actually enough to prove Drouet's von Neumann inequality. Because the the key observation uh, you need to make is that if uh, uh, if t is a row contraction and you multiply it by a number r which is uh, less than one, then it becomes pure. This is easy to see because if uh, uh, if you multiply by r, then this theta i theta of i is less than or equal to r squared. Uh, so when you iterate it, uh, it actually converges to zero and norm. So if you have a, a row contraction, you, you do this trick, you multiply by r, and um, then it coextends to a direct sum of copies of mz. And so p of r t is at most the norm of p of mz. And uh, p of mz is nothing else than the multiplication operator by p. So this is by definition, uh, the multiply norm on the Drouet Allison space. And then you let R go to one in the end. And because you have a polynomial, there's no issue with, uh, with convergence here. So uh, this special case of the dilation theorem involving pure uh, commuting world contractions is enough to, to get the von Neumann inequality. All right, so let me actually show you uh, at least the, the main ingredients of this uh, proof in the, in the pure case, um, because it's actually not, uh, not all that difficult. Uh, so what you do is, is something that uh, you can also do in one variable. You look at the defect operator. Uh, so you look at uh, this identity minus some ti ti star. This is a positive operator because you have a, a, a row contraction. And so it has a positive square root, which uh, you can also rewrite as this, just by this, this definition of, uh, of this map theta. So theta of i is uh, some ti ti star. And then the whole trick is to write down uh, a very particular operator. It uh, goes from H into Drouet-Alvesen space tensor H, uh, or you can you can make it smaller, but uh, this is this is one way of doing it. And uh, it has this form. So you apply it to a vector H, and you look at this sum. There are these weights that we've seen before, and then in the first tensor component you look at Z to the alpha, and in the second tensor component uh, you write this. You take the defect operator times T star to the alpha applied to H. Okay, so this might look strange, but uh, this operator is to do is supposed to do one thing and, and one thing only, namely it's supposed to intertwine multiplication by zi star and, and ti star. And let's look at this if it's at least plausible. Well, what happens if you multiply by 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 ti star on, on the right here? Well, then you increase your um, multi-index here, it becomes alpha plus ei. And similarly, if you multiply by mzi star on the left, then you decrease the, the multi-index of z to the alpha, it becomes something like alpha minus ei, and then there are maybe some, some weights that you have to take care of. But if you ignore the scalars, then this matches up because then if you do an index shift, uh, these, uh, these terms you get by right multiplying with ti star and left multiplying, multiplying by mzi star, they match up. And the way it's just work out so that this is actually not just up to scalars, but it, it's really on the nodes. So we have this operator. And the fact that T is a pure row contraction turns out to translate to the fact that this operator V is an isometry. So this is a computation, um, which I wrote down. Uh, I mean, it's not going to come up again, but uh, I wanted to show it to you because it's actually not, uh, not really difficult. And uh, it also shows again why these weights pop up. So what you can do is you look at the, uh, uh, the norm of, of, of VH squared, which by definition, uh, if, you, uh, if you look at the definition of VH and, uh, and, and bring uh, delta T star to the alpha on the other side in the inner product, uh, 
uh, it looks like this. And, and then you do the usual trick. You write the, uh, the sum of our multi-indices. You first sum of our multi-indices of length n, and then you sum of all n at the end. And uh, the thing to remember here is that delta squared, this uh, uh, defect operator is identity minus theta of i. So then when you think about this for a minute, you see that um, if you sum over all multi-indices of length n here, what you get is a difference of two terms. And the first one is theta to the n of identity. And the second one is theta to the n plus one of the identity. This is essentially like in a multinomial theorem. And it's again, why these weights are the, are the appropriate ones. And then you get a telescoping sum and uh, you can write it like this. And then the tail tends to zero, which is exactly what purity is about. So this is why you want purity. So V is an isometry and we have uh, this important relation here. And so what this relation says is that the range of V is invariant under NZI star tensor identity. And uh, also on the range NZI star tensor identity, the identity is unitarily equivalent to TI star because the unitary is now just V, but you think of it as an operator onto the range. And so this is it, right? So we, we have co-extended, so we, or we have extended a ti star to mzi star tensor identity so this co-extends t to mz tensor identity so modulo these uh, these computations which i i didn't do in detail but but then they're, they're not particularly difficult uh, this actually proves the uh, the dilation theorem in the pure case so it's uh, it's maybe not as, uh, as 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 hard to do as you might think okay now what about the non-pure case well let me just very roughly hint at it, um, because one way to do it involves an object which is of independent interest, and this is the, the triplets algebra. So the triplets algebra is the C-star algebra generated by these multiplication operators on, uh, so inside of bounded operators on the Dura-Alvesen space. So it's called the triplets algebra because in one variable, uh, this is the classical triplets algebra, which is generated by all triplets operators on the Hardy space with continuous symbol. And it's known that in one variable, you have this, this nice short exact sequence. And Arvison proved uh, that this is also true on the drury Arvison space. So you have a short exact sequence of C-star algebras uh, from the compacts going into the triplets algebra, going into continuous functions on the sphere, where the maps are the natural ones. So the first one is, is inclusion of the compacts. And the second one is a continuous function, is, is the one that sends uh, multiplication by ZI to, to, to ZI. So this short exact sequence contains actually a lot of information. Uh, for instance, it says that, um, well, the triplets operator contains the compacts. It says that multiplication by ZI is essentially normal because it's commutative module of the compacts, this, uh, this triplet C star algebra. And it tells you that the essential spectrum of this multiplication tuple is, uh, is the unit sphere. And so this has a lot of, uh, of uses, but one of which is that you can use it to prove the dilation theorem in the, in the non-pure case. And uh, the idea behind this is, well, you want to so start with your operator tuple T on, on, on B of H, and, and you want to apply the dilation theorem in the pure case. So you apply the dilation theorem to RT, and then you want to take some kind of limit as R goes to one. Um, but you can't really take a limit of the dilations because the dilations live on this big Hilbert space and they don't really hang together very nicely. So uh, what you can do instead is you can use sort of abstract ideas from dilation theory to reformulate this. And uh, the crucial point is that you, you get a map, let's say rho r on the triplets algebra into, into B of H now, so into the small Hilbert space, which sends, uh, let's say mzi to r times ti. And uh, this map is what's known as a completely positive map. So it's, it's completely positive. I'm not specifying it completely here, but uh, there is a completely positive map that satisfies this. And you can arrange it to be unital as well. And so here you can take a limit. Then you can take a limit as r goes to one because this map only uh, goes into the small Hilbert space. Um, and then you can dilate that map using what's called the, the Stein-Spring dilation theorem. And then you need to know what do these representations of the triplets algebra look like. And this is uh, the key point that every unital star homomorphism from the triplet C star algebra into B of K splits as a direct sum of two representations, one of which comes from the compact operators and one of uh, which comes from the continuous functions on the sphere. And so the representations of the compact operators, they are 
They're very simple. They are all unitarily equivalent to a direct sum of the identity representation. So this pi one of MZ is a direct sum of copies of multiplication by Z. And uh, this uh, pi two of MZ comes from continuous function of the sphere. So this gives you spherical unitary. So the point I want to make here is that this uh, C-star algebraic statement about uh, the, uh, the, the triplet C-star algebra uh, is one way to explain where the two different pieces in the, uh, in the dilation come from, right? The, so one of them comes from the first bit in the short exact sequence and the second one comes from, from the second bit, right? Now, this is also a good place to uh, mention the, the essential normality conjecture uh, of, of Arvison. Uh, so yesterday we had a talk by, by, by E1 where she uh, explained a lot of this, uh, 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 you know, much better than, than, than I'm going to. I'm just going to uh, briefly skim the surface here. So the basic fact that motivates this is that uh, this multiplication tuple, as I mentioned, is essentially normal. So the, the, the commutators of, uh, of MZ with, uh, with the adjoint are, are compact. And uh, so, so this is encoded in the short exact sequence, but you can uh, uh, prove it also using elementary means. And then uh, suppose you have a homogeneous ideal in the polynomial ring and to avoid trivialities, let's assume it has infinite co-dimension. Uh, so this means by, uh, by the Nullstellen satz that uh, in the vanishing locus, there's a point which is not the origin. And then what you can do is you can take your multiplication tuple MZ and you can compress it to the orthogonal complement of uh, the homogeneous ideal i. And because i is an ideal, it's invariant under multiplication by, by z. So uh, um, this, this tuple si is still a commuting tuple. It's still a commuting tuple of, uh, of, of row contractions. And what Arvison conjectured is that it's also essentially normal. Um, this is not obvious because uh, in general, restrictions of essentially normal operators to invariant subspaces are not essentially normal. So it's, it's something that needs proof. And, um, as, as, as E explained yesterday, uh, he had a, a number of motivations for this, but uh, one of which has to do with the short exact sequence that I just mentioned. Namely, uh, if this conjecture is true, then you get a similar short exact sequence uh, for the triplets algebra generated by, by SI. So this TI is the triplets algebra generated by, by SI. So saying that this is essentially normal, it says that the quotient by the compact is commutative and you can work out what the maximum ideal space is. It's the vanishing locus of the ideal uh, intersect with the, with the unit sphere. And so you get this short exact sequence. And I mean, very roughly speaking, Arvison's vision was to connect operator theory of uh, this uh, tuple SI and of the, uh, the triplets uh, algebra generated by SI to the algebraic geometry of uh, the vanishing locus of, of I. Um, also, as, as E explained yesterday, there's actually a stronger con conjecture. So it's not just about compactness, but uh, the commutator should belong to some Schatten class. And then there's a, a refinement about which Schatten class it should be due to Douglas. So sometimes people also call this the Argus and Douglas conjecture. Um, so there are lots, so this is still open, this conjecture, uh, but there are lots of partial results. And um, uh, I just picked out one. Uh, which is uh, due to uh, English and Eschmeyer and, and independently due to Douglas, Tang, and, and U. And uh, it says that if you have a radical ideal, so, so this is an ideal by the Nullstellen satz, which is uh, completely determined by the, uh, the vanishing locus. Um, and if you assume that the, uh, the vanishing locus is smooth away from the origin, uh, then it's, um, then this Arvison conjecture is true, then SI is essentially normal. And, and actually this stronger Arvison Douglas conjecture is true. Uh, so, as I said, this is just skimming the surface. If you want to know more about this, well, hopefully you were at, at East talk yesterday, but if you weren't and you want to know more about this, then, uh, you know, check out her talk on YouTube. And so, so, so she, ex she also explained um, uh, a lot of other partial results that, that are known, but in general, it's still open. All right. Um, let me also mention functional calculus as another application of this uh, dilation uh, ideas. Um, so you can re rephrase the, uh, the von Neumann inequality for the Dreyerusen space in, in, sort of in terms of functional calculus. And, and the way this works is, is like this. So let's denote by, by AD uh, the norm closure of the polynomials in the multiplier algebra. Uh, so you're supposed to think of something like, uh, like the disk algebra, right? If, if D is one, then this is really the disk algebra. And so you can re rephrase this phenomenon inequality as saying that if you have a commuting row contraction on a Hilbert space, uh, 
then it admits an AB functional calculus, which means that you have a, a unital contractive homomorphism on AB that extends the polynomial functional calculus, right? Because these tuple, these operators commute, you can plug them into ordinary polynomials, of course, but then you want to do, want to do more. And actually, this is a completely contractive homomorphism, so it's contractive at every matrix level. And this is really, this follows immediately from the Vonnemann inequality, because the Vonnemann inequality says that it's contractive on polynomials, and then it just extends by, by continuity. Um, now, if you're familiar with operator theory in one variable, uh, then you know that this is not the end of the story, uh, far from it. Um, for many operators, you can uh, extend this, uh, this functional calculus in one variable to an H-infinity functional calculus, um, which, uh, which turned out to be very important, for instance, when you try to prove that certain operators have invariant subspaces. And so there is a, a theorem of, uh, of Tuatra and Davidson, uh, which does exactly this, uh, namely for uh, completely non-unitary uh, commuting row contractions. So completely non-unitary just means that you don't have a spherical unitary sum n, um, which is really a harmless assumption because a general commuting row contraction splits as a direct sum of a completely non-unitary bit and a, a spherical unitary bit. And so the spherical unitary bit, uh, you understand using uh, the spectral theorem. And so what's left is, uh, is, is the completely non-unitary bit. So this is the, uh, the, the, the one that you want to study. And so they showed if you have such a completely non-unitary commuting row contraction, uh, then it admits a multiplier functional calculus. So you can extend this map that you have on AD by the von Neumann inequality uh, to a weak star continuous homomorphism on the whole multiplier algebra. So um, the multiplier algebra and B of H turn out to be dual spaces. And uh, so you have continuity with respect to, uh, to, uh, to, to both weak star topologies here. So if D is one, then this is the, the, the Nag Foyage H infinity functional calculus. Uh, that you might have heard of. Um, there's also a different proof of this Kalatra Davidson theorem, uh, uh, which I did with, uh, with Kelly Bickle and John McCarthy. And so if you want to le learn more about this, you can, uh, can either look at the paper of uh, uh, Ken and Raphael or at, at our paper. Okay, so I could talk a lot more about the operator theory, um, but uh, since this is a, 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 a conference about uh, function spaces, I thought I'd uh, I spend a little bit more time on the on the function space aspects of it, and so this this last part today is is mostly to warm you up for tomorrow uh, when I'm going to talk about um, these complete pick spaces and what the role that Ray Allison space uh, plays there. So let's start at the beginning of the of the story, uh, which is uh, which is over 100 years ago, when uh, when Pick uh, proved an interpolation theorem in the in the unit disk and and there's a, independently this was done by by Nemadlina a couple of years later. And so the interpolation problem they looked at is uh, you have n points in the, in the disk. So these are your interpolation uh, nodes and you have n targets, lambda one up to lambda n. And then the question is, can you find an H-infinity function that uh, solves your interpolation problem and has supernorm at most one? And, and pick proof that, that you can do this if and only if uh, this uh, Hermitian n by n matrix, uh, which is written here, is, is a positive semi-definite matrix. Right? So we saw this, this theorem yesterday in, in Jacob's talk, for instance. Um, so, I mean, the usual comments I make at this point is, is first of all, uh, you, you don't have to assume that the targets belong to the closed disk because this is encoded in positivity of the pick matrix, right? Because if the pick matrix is positive semi-definite, then the diagonal entries are non-negative, uh, which exactly encodes that uh, the lambda is have matches at most one. And, and the second comment uh, is that uh, this is, uh, so it's a non-trivial interpolation problem because you want your function to be holomorphic and bounded at the same time, right? If you drop the boundedness assumption, then you can just do Lagrange interpolation with polynomials. And uh, if you just want it to be bounded and real smooth, then it's also easy to do, but uh, having holomorphic and bounded as a requirement is, is what makes it non-trivial. Okay, now, um, of course, this theorem predates Hilbert spaces. Um, but there is a, a reproducing kernel Hilbert space interpretation of this, which turned out to be very influential. And, and uh, might, I think in this uh, focus program, uh, this is fairly easy to motivate because we should think of H infinity as the multipliers of H2, and we should think of the soup norm as the multiplier norm on, on H2. And, uh, and then the connection to a, a sort of abstract reproducing kernel Hilbert space theory is, uh, is the following basic fact, namely, if you have any reproducing kernel Hilbert space, uh, then you can characterize the multipliers uh, in terms of positivity of certain matrices that look like the pick matrix. Uh, 
so so, so the uh, the statement is that if you have a, a function then it has multiplier norm at most one if and only if for every finite set f in your domain um, these n by n matrices uh, that kind of look like the pick matrix are positive semi-definite matrices All right so if you take as an example if you take the uh, the reproducing kernel here to be the Shig uh, the, the Ziegel kernel uh, one over one minus z w bar uh, then uh, and you and you just look at your interpolation nodes uh, then then this precisely becomes uh, the pick matrix uh, so this proves one direction in in the pick theorem it uh, it proves necessity right because if you have a uh, an interpolation if, if you have a solution to the interpolation problem then there's this function phi and then this basic multiplier criterion says that the uh, all the pick matrices of this function have to be positive. And so in particular, the pick matrix at your given interpolation nodes has to be positive. And, and so Saracen observed that uh, you can also turn this around and you can use a uh, commutant lifting, for instance, to, uh, to prove the pick theorem. Uh, in fact, Saracen did this before the general commutant lifting theorem was around. So, so he proved the first important special case. Okay. so. Uh, Right. The usual joke is that uh, good theorems never die; they only become definitions. And so, 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 so this is exactly what uh, what happens here. Uh, you can turn this into a definition. So, if you have a, uh, a Hilbert, a reproducing kernel Hilbert space with reproducing kernel, then we say it's uh, it's a pick space if if pick's theorem holds true. So, if uh, whenever you have uh, n points in your domain and n targets where the pick matrix is positive semi-definite, where the pick matrix now involves this uh, this reproducing kernel. Uh, then the multi-interpolation problem has a solution. So you can find an interpolating multiplier and that has multiplier norm at most one. And uh, it turns out that uh, things become cleaner if you don't just assume this at for scalar targets, but for matrix targets. And, and this is what a complete pick space is. So a complete pick space is one where, where this is true for, for matrix targets. And uh, sometimes it's also convenient to say that K is a complete pick kernel. So you can either talk about the Hilbert space or about the, um, the, the kernel, it's the same thing, right? So um, you might say, well, why should we take this particular theorem and turn it into a definition, right? It's, um, it's maybe not the first theorem that uh, from complex analysis that comes to your mind. Uh, but I think in this case, um, the proof of the pudding is really in the eating. And uh, there are, uh, so there are interesting uh, spaces in this class, in particular spaces that people cared about before uh, anyone talked about complete pick spaces, uh, such as the Dirichlet space that we learned about in, in Tom Ransford's uh, lecture series. And uh, this uh, point of view gives, uh, gives sort of a new handle on these objects, um, which has, I think, been, uh, been quite useful. Okay, so let me finish up for today by reformulating this, uh, this, this pick condition, and, and then we're going to pick it up uh, there tomorrow. So um, there's a, a reformulation of this pick condition, which uh, I find uh, a fairly useful and it involves restricting your reproducing kernel Hilbert space to a subset. So the idea is if you have a reproducing kernel Hilbert space uh, on, on a big set X, then for every subset, you can just restrict your functions to the subset and then give it the quotient norm, right? So you say that, that the norm of, of G on the restriction is uh, the inf over all norms of functions on, on, on the big set that restrict to, to your given set, to your given function G. And then this is a reproducing kernel Hilbert space on Y, whose reproducing kernel is the restriction of, of the kernel on, on the big space to Y. And, and the point is that um, it, it's very easy, it's essentially tautological from the definition that uh, if you have a multiplier on the whole thing and you restrict it to a subset, uh, then you also get a multiplier on the subset and the norm can only go down. So this restriction map is a, is a complete contraction. And uh, the pick property is exactly saying that this restriction map is a quotient map. So uh, H is a pick space if for every finite set this restriction map is a quotient map and it's a complete pick space if it's a complete quotient map. So, so um, quotient map means, well usually quotient map means the open ball gets mapped onto the open ball, uh, but in this case it, it doesn't matter if you say open ball or closed ball because uh, you have weak star compactness. So it's, it's the same thing. So you can just think of the closed bar, which is a bit easier to think about. So um, why is this th the same thing? Well, it just follows from chasing definitions because if you have a finite subset of your domain and if you have, a f so a function on this finite subset is nothing else than you specify the values for the endpoints in your set. 
and saying that your function has multiplier norm at most one on the subset by this basic multiplier criterion I had on the other side is just the same as saying that the pick matrix is positive. So this condition says that if you have pick interpolation data on F, then it lifts to a, a multiply on the whole thing. So because of this, you can think of uh, the, this pick property as some sort of localization property, right? It says that what well, well, local means you define on, on, on finite sets. So if you have something that looks like a multiplier and it's defined on finite sets, then you can lift it to a bona fide multiplier uh, on the whole thing. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to pick pick up here tomorrow and uh, talk about well what these pick spaces are good for and and also uh, how they relate to the Dewey Arvidsson space. So that's it for today. Hey, Michael, uh, questions, comments, suggestions. If there are no questions, let's thank Michael again. The next talk will be in nine minutes. Thank you.